Hey everyone, good morning. Thank you so much for joining us online this morning. My name is Josiah Kaiser. I'm the high school youth pastor here at the chapel, and I'm going to open us with prayer. Uh, so if you would, bow your heads and let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you just for another day, Father. Thank you for this morning, Father. Thank you for the church, Father. Thank you for the body. Father, I thank you for everything you are doing in a world that is just crazy right now, Father. There is still good that is happening, Father. I pray that you will use all of us in a powerful way in this time right now, Father, to show hope, to show light, Father, in darkness, to show love, compassion, mercy, and grace. I pray for this, this message today that Joel's going to give, Father. I pray that it speaks to our hearts, encourages us, and helps us in the, in the areas that we need it, Father. Thank you for your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Alone in my sorrow and dead in my sin Lost without hope with no place to begin Your love made a way to let mercy come in when death was arrested and my life began and Ash was redeemed, only beauty remains And my orphan heart was given a name My morning grew quiet, my feet rose to dance when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your endless love Bring down on us You have made us new Now life begins with you Released from my chains I'm a prisoner no more My shame was a ransom He faithfully bore He canceled my debt And he called me his friend when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over me You have made me new, now life begins with you It's your Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost But then Jesus arose with our freedom in hand That's when death was arrested and my life began Oh, your grace so free washes over
my life began No, oh, when death was arrested And my life began That's when death was arrested And my life began Hey, once to say again I have a short message I want to give to all the high schoolers that are watching and for anyone else that is watching. Uh, something that I was just going over in my head was uh, just my past of trying to control things too much and not enough surrender. And that's something that God asked us to is surrender. But something that I was battling with a lot in my past was trying to just control things especially in my relationship with God, of things like I wanted to do and the things I didn't want to do. There's an analogy I want to share with you about a war, and just two armies, and what would happen to one of the armies if they were surrounded. If an army was surrounded and they were cornered and they knew that there was, a, a, there was no way of winning, they would, they would raise a white flag and surrender. You know, that they want to try to survive and they just knew that there was no way of them getting through this. But what if I told you that there is a way for you to win, that you actually didn't have to fight, but you do have to raise your white flag? The reason I'm saying white flag is that that is you telling God that you are not in control anymore and that he is. We have to remind ourselves that we serve a God who is willing to fight for us and win the battles for us because he loves us so much. But in the moments of life, we tend to forget. We tend to try to control and try to get through problems by ourselves. It never works out well. But I want to challenge you right now that's okay to raise your white flag and surrender to God and allow him to fight everything that you have been trying to fight this whole time. I want you to remember that when you stop trying to control what you can't, you allow God to control what he can. I want to give you four just little notes, little points. That this will help you to surrender. The first one is to seek God. The last week I talked about just finding that alone time with God, how vital that is, that God wants just time alone with you. It's so important that we come into this, this time with God and surrendering everything, all the weight, all the brokenness, all the anger, all the anxiousness, all the oppression, that we just give it to him. Secondly, we listen to him. I think a lot of us will talk so much, but we don't listen enough. As God has things he wants to say to us. He has things he wants to show us. So make sure that even after you tell God what you're going through and what you want and what you want help with, that you listen for a response. Thirdly, as we talk to him, I don't think there's ever a moment where there's too much prayer. So I want you to work on that right now is prayer. Is praying, talking to God about what you're going through right now in your life. I don't know what it is, but God does and that's all that matters. And lastly, number four, is cut out the distractions. Is there's so many things all around us, you know this, it's so easy for us to pay attention to the wrong thing. So when you're seeking God, when you're listening, and when you're talking to Him, ask Him just for protection from those distractions. I have a verse I want to share with you in Matthew 16, 24. It says, Then Jesus said to His disciples, If anyone wishes to come after Me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. I challenge you to pick up your cross today. And just remember this. One more thing I want to leave you is God can do more with your surrender than you can do with your control. Let us pray. Father, thank you for your goodness, Father. I pray that today, Father, surrender happens. Father, that today, weight is lifted. That today, Healing happens. Father, so many times in life we try to control things, Father, it never turns out well. And I just pray that today it stops, Father, that we give full control to you, Father. That we, that we raise the white flag, surrendering, Father, our control 
to allow you to come in and take control, Father. I thank you for your goodness, your love, your mercy, your forgiveness. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes Come today, there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy From the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. No what a Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with The precious blood of Jesus Christ Oh, come to the altar The Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ.
Bear your cross as you wait for the crown Tell the world of the treasure you found Well, hello again. Uh, again, I'm Pastor Todd here at the Chapel in Marlboro. My responsibility is being the pastor of sports and middle school. So I've always enjoyed spending time with kids. And so it's my privilege again to give a kid's presentation. Um, today, I thought maybe we would just talk a little bit about feelings and some of the things we might be experiencing. Uh, I don't know about you, but I've been feeling a little down, uh, definitely feeling a little annoyed not being able to go out and do the things I like to do or maybe spend time with the people I like to spend time with. Uh, and certainly I'm missing spending time with my loved ones who aren't in my immediate house. And I'm sure you're feeling the same way. And anytime I start to feel down, I've always been able to kind of turn to music. And music has always been a way that I can enhance my mood or just maybe make my mood, you know, just change the way I was feeling. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. Do you guys maybe have a favorite um, singer, songwriter that, that is uh, currently, you know, uh, kind of going? For me, uh, growing up, Michael W. Smith obviously was a, a big time person who did a lot of music and uh, made a lot of songs that we sang in church. Uh, and currently, I really like Chris Tomlin and Zach Williams. They both are two of my favorites. Uh, and I really did just love music growing up. In fact, I grew up in a little tiny church in Louisville, not far from this church. And we would sing a lot of hymns, but we also had a special little songbook we would sing out of. And we sang this song that I just really loved, and it was called The Magic Penny. Now, it sounds kind of cheesy now maybe to you, but for me as a kid, it really meant a lot. And, and kind of the gist of it was uh, the magic penny is something that if you hold really tight, you wouldn't have any. But if you would lend it and you would spend it, you'd have so many, they'd roll everywhere. And so the idea is that love is like that magic penny. We want to shower people and show people love and not hold it inside. Because when we do that, we get love in return. So much love, in fact, uh, we just can't even, you know, comprehend all the love that we could get back from people, but especially from God as well. And, and it's interesting when we start to look at music, because I don't know if you know this or not, but there's a, a song or a, a, a psalm uh, in the Bible. In the, it's the book of Psalms. It's actually chapter um, 103. It's my favorite psalm. And it talks like about praise the Lord, O my soul. And it repeats that several times throughout the, the uh, chapter. And that song is something that always meant a lot to me too, because it reminded me that not only was my attitude important in how I felt, but it was important in how I worshiped. And I needed to remember that God loved me first. And that's why I love him back. Uh, he loves us so much that he gave his son. You know, he sacrificed his son for us. And we need to be reminded of that sometimes and be grateful of the things that we have and the experiences that we're having. Even when we don't understand God's plan, we know that God loves us and cares for us in even the darkest of times. And so the Psalm 103 is really important to me, and it's a song from the Bible. And I hope that you guys also can turn to music uh, as you're feeling different or you're feeling maybe left out, turn to music, look up a psalm, see if there's something that can brighten your spirit the way that Psalm 103 has always brightened mine. Thank you guys very much, and we'll see you real soon here at the church. There are a few ways that you can give. Uh, you can mail your donation into our church's P.O. box. Uh, there is also the, avail the availability of online giving, uh, at our church's website, or you can text your donation to uh, 21456. So any of those ways um, are you can send your gift in. And at this time, we'll go ahead and ask prayer uh, for our tithes and our offerings. So if you could bow your head, please. Father God, we give today with joy in our hearts, and we ask your blessing on our offering. O oh Lord, work through these gifts and extend your love through us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hello Church! Today we would like to remind you that summer is right around the corner and it's time to start looking forward to Vacation Bible School. This year our program is called Rocky Railway and our theme is Jesus Power Pulls Us Through. So far this has been a good year to remind us just how much we need Jesus Power in our lives and we can't wait to invite families into the chapel in Marlboro to explore God's Word and celebrate the hope that Jesus gives us. Now our VBS this year will be July 6th through the 10th and it'll be 6.15 p.m. till 8.45 p.m. each evening. Now we're busy making all the preparations for God to open the church up and to bring the children and all the volunteers for the full VBS experience. But of course, we can't know just what the conditions will be like in July. And that's why we're also making plans and working with the pastors to have alternate plans in place to deliver this program safely, even if there are still risks or restrictions in place at the time. But we're gonna make sure that one way or another, kids get the message this summer that Jesus' power pulls us through. And that VBS is still filled with fun memories for everyone. Please help us by spreading the word. Our online registration is open and we need families to get signed up so that we can plan effectively and keep everyone informed as the event gets closer. So go to our church website and look for the link. It's gonna be an easy form to fill out and only kids who are pre-registered this year are gonna get those free t-shirts. We're gonna do our best to keep you informed as we make plans. Now you can expect to learn a lot more coming in June about how you can get involved and what to expect. But please, make your plans now and get signed up. If you have any questions or issues with the registration process, just reach out to the church office or you can contact me directly, Candy Shifley. All right, we're looking forward to July and we'll see you soon. Bye. Hey everybody, my name is Nolan Domer. Uh, I help out here at the Chapel of Marlboro with Josiah Kaiser. I'm an assistant youth leader. I'm going to be doing the uh, scripture reading today from Exodus chapter 3, verse 6 through 7, and verses 13 through 14. Verse 6 says, And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Verse 7 says, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. Verse 13 says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Say to this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan Domer, for providing our scripture reading today. This scripture reading gives us a profound identity for God. And one thing we never want to overlook in our study of the Bible, and in particular, the Old Testament, and even the Gospels, is that names in the Jewish society carry a significance in that they reflect the character of the bearer of that name. So for example, Jacob has the name that means supplanter or deceitful one. And we know that he engaged in deceit, trickery, mischief, in supplanting Esau as the one who would receive the covenant promises from their father, Isaac. Fortunately for Jacob, he had an encounter with God and God, through his supernatural work within a person's heart, changed his character and renamed him. He didn't want him to go through life with the name Deceitful One. He wanted him to go through life now known as Israel, which means the Prince of God or the Chosen One of God. He was now the bearer of the covenant and the one who was to represent God through his life through his teachings and through his children to the rest of the world, which of course he did, being the father of the nation, Israel. And then there was Nabal, found in 1 Samuel chapter 25, a man whose name means the foolish one or fool. It's interesting to me since the Hebrew people retained their child at home for seven days so they could 
see certain traits within that child. And then they carried that child into the temple on day eight and provided him with a name. It is interesting that he would be given this name. I don't know if he was given that name by his parents or whether later in life when it became obvious that he was a very irrational man who allowed his passions to drive him rather than his mind, whether others gave him the name Nabal. I tend to think no parent would give a child that name. But later, as the community observed the type of character he possessed, they chose to give that name to him themselves. And a fool he was, and he was struck dead. But that's his name. And then there is, of course, Saul, named after the first king of Israel, renamed Paul, the apostle, a name that means small. The small one in God's sight, the large one in our sight as the great apostle to the Gentiles. Now we come to this episode where Moses is at the burning bush and we've tried to study different characteristics that we learn about God at this burning bush. The first, the bush is not consumed by the fire. The fire needs no source for its existence and God needs no outside source for his existence. He is self-existent. He exists within himself. He is life, the source of all life, both temporal and eternal. And that's why he can offer it to us. It is inherent within his being and he provides it to us, eternal life, life with God forevermore. And that's what we learn about the bush that is not consumed. Then we looked at who is in the fire. The angel of the Lord is actually the fire. And we learn from Acts chapter 7 when Stephen is giving his presentation to the Sanhedrin, which later stones Stephen, by the way. But in that presentation, he says that this fire had the form of a human, the form of a person. And that is another reason why Moses said, I must draw near and see this phenomenon. The fire had the form of a person. Well, who was that person? That person is the Lord Jesus Christ, which we learn from Acts chapter 9, when Saul the rabbi is consumed by this fiery cloud, this fire. And a voice speaks, and he asks, who is this? And the answer is, it's Jesus whom you persecute. So this angel of the Lord, this theophany, God visible, is what the word theophany means. God made visible prior to the incarnation of Christ and called the angel of the Lord. This angel of the Lord is actually the Lord Jesus Christ. And he calls out, Moses, Moses, a term of affection calling Moses unto himself. Then we looked at the holy ground. Take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. We must cross the boundary into God's presence. He calls us with affection and love. Uh, we must respond. Have you crossed that boundary into the presence of God and been saved? And now we get to these verses in 13 and 14 where Moses says to God, if I come to the people of Israel and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, what is his name? What will I tell them? And the answer is, God said to Moses, I am who I am. I am who I am. This is actually a translation of the name. The name is JVHV, or Jehovah is the way we pronounce it, or Yahweh, it's the same word. One is a, a transliteration, the other is uh, another transliteration, but a little different. It's interesting that the Hebrew people and the rabbis call this the non-pronounceable name, and it is non-pronounceable. And the reason for that is because 
It is all consonants. No vowels were added to this name until 500 years after Christ when the rabbis began adding vowels and manuscript copyists added vowels so that we could at least get a handle on it and s s pronounce it. But still, even though we now can read it and give it some uh, lip service, some pronunciation, still it's the name that a dedicated Jew in prayer will not mention. He will either substitute a name for Jehovah or he will simply nod his head when he prays. And you've probably seen videos of the Jewish people praying at the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem and you'll see them nod. That means this name is in their prayer and they will not pronounce it. Their thinking is there's a reason it's all consonants and cannot be pronounced because there are no vowels. God doesn't want us to pronounce it. It's too holy for sinful man to utter. But God gives the translation, doesn't he? I am that I am. Just tell them I am has sent you. And with this translation, we learn something about God. I would be remiss if I did not mention to you that the Lord Jesus Christ uses this identification for himself many times over as he ministers to the Jewish nation in his time, proclaiming himself to be the Messiah, the promised of God. He also claims to be the great I am. John's gospel dedicates itself almost entirely to the theme of Jesus as the I am and can be understood by looking at the I am statements of Jesus. Now I will give you one of those statements in John 8. Jesus is meeting with the leaders of the Israelite nation and uh, he is telling them that he saw Abraham in Abraham's day. And they say to him, how can that be? You're not yet even 40 years old. How is it that you knew Abraham? And Jesus reply, John 8, 58 is, before Abraham was, I am. And then the scriptures say, they pick up rocks to kill him because they know that this is the name of the deity. They figure he is committed blasphemy. It's not blasphemy. Jesus makes that claim. It's Jesus who is in the fire. It's Jesus who is with Moses. And it's Jesus who is the I am that I am. Two thoughts that I want to share briefly about this name, I am that I am. First, it is derived from the Hebrew verb that means to be. When a child is asked, what do you want to be when you grow up? The child will reply, I want to be, and then complete the sentence. If it's a boy, he'll probably say one thing. If it's a girl, she may say something else. But the idea is to be means this will be who I am. A being, a being. The second thought I want to give is from Merrill Tinney and his Zondervan Biblical Encyclopedia. And he says that I am that I am could just as well have been translated, I who am always present. I who am always present. Now that's a very encouraging thought to us. And it would have been to Moses. And maybe we can personalize this name of God a little bit by using Tinney's idea. Merrill Tinney was a great biblical scholar now with the Lord. Professor at Wheaton College for many years. I am who is always present. Moses, you go see Pharaoh. Don't be intimidated. 
I am always present with you. Do you know that 365 times in the Bible, God gives us a promise that he is always present with us? So that makes good sense for this name. But to come from the verb to be poses an interesting idea as well. The Bible assumes that we understand some things about ourselves, that we are, for example, made in God's image, that we have the gift of life, that we are to do something with our life, make it count, hopefully live it for the glory of God. And if you live it for God's glory, it matters not if you preach to stadiums full or whether you serve in a kitchen. As long as you do it for the glory of God, your reward will be great and God will use your life. Aristotle had some thoughts on being. And in his writings and musings about life, in his ethics, he asks and then attempts to answer the question, which is the ancients' way of doing things. They pose a question, then they answer it. What does it mean to be a being? To be a being means to possess self-awareness. We are aware of that which I said the Bible assumes. We are aware that we're people. We are aware that we get hungry. We are aware that we have a life to live. We are aware that we have to make certain choices about our lives. And most of all, and this is interesting, we are aware that we are aware. And with that, he says, what makes us a human being, unlike a lower species that may have the ability to think and realize it's hungry, is that we are able to be rational, to think through the circumstances of life and to make decisions based upon the data that is before us. God, as he is presented in the burning bush to Exodus, certainly is aware of his self-existence. He is certainly rational. And he is certainly aware of what's going on around him. Now, let's look at this God. Verse 7 and 8 of Exodus 3. The Lord himself says this, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of their land to a good land. What does this tell us about God, the being of God? It tells us, of course, that he is a person. He is able to see. He is able to hear. He is able to know. And he is able to act. And with those attributes or those characteristics, he is certainly a being. He is a divine being. We call him the supreme being. And he here makes a promise to Moses that supersedes anything any human person could do. He will deliver his people out of bondage. Of course, that's not something Pharaoh would have wanted to do. The Israelites serving as slaves were the economy of ancient Egypt. But now think about what he has just said in verses 7 and 8. And we go back to verses 13 and 14 and we see where the translation of Jehovah or of YHVH is I am I. 
God knows who he is. God knows what he can do. God is sure of himself and he is sure of his abilities. And so he makes a promise. <clears throat> and he calls Israel my people. It is from this moment on that the Israelite nation looks to this name revealed to Moses as the special name of God to them. You might read in commentaries or in footnotes in study Bibles that this becomes the covenant name of God. What does that mean? That means that God now acknowledges these are his people and he's going to work on their behalf. And it's from this point on that the name, the Lord, now that's the translation all in capital letters in your Bibles, that the Lord becomes Israel's God and promises to deliver them. Our God, the one who is identified later as Jesus Christ, who claims to be the great I am, is a God with a mind. He understands us. He understands you. Whatever your circumstances in life, he knows you and cares about you. He is a God who is understanding. I have heard their cries. He is a God who is decisive. I will act on their behalf. He is a God who exercises will. I will deliver them out of bondage. In other words, he is a relational God. And he even says, this will be my memorial name, meaning all the future generations of the Israelite people will know me by this name. I am the God who knows you. I am the God who cares about you. I am the God who makes a promise to you. I am the God who will deliver you. Now take all those ideas about the person of God or the being of God and apply them to Jesus. Jesus has said he knows us. Jesus has said he loves us. The New Testament proclaims that Jesus will save us, that Jesus will deliver us from our sins, which is the act of salvation, and that Jesus will promise us a future with him in heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. So God is a person, the being of God. Secondly of all, verses 13 and 14, God is eternal. And I go back to what Merrill Tinney said, that whereas this has historically been translated, the name of God as I am that I am, it could have been translated, I am who is always present. God is eternal. God is always present. God has always existed, in other words. There has never been a time when he was born. There will never be a time when he will die. He does not age. This we call the immutability of God. He never changes. He is eternal. He is the only, ultimate, perfect, unblemished, all-powerful, always present, supreme being. Is it no wonder as we discuss his character of a great mind and a great love and a great passion for those who come to him. And now we see that he is the only one who is eternal, that we just simply stand in awe of him. This is what commands our worship and our adoration of God. We are awed by his presence. In Genesis 1.1, we read, in the beginning, God. There was nothing before God. He was here. And in Revelation 22, we find that after this world has passed away, yes, we will be with God forever, but he is still there. And that's why our scriptures can say in the book of Hebrews, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today and forever. He is a God who loves us. 
He is a God who understands us. He is a God who will deliver us. And he is a God who will never change. Never change in his love. Never change in his compassion. Never change in his care. And never change in his power to save. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Shall we pray? Dear Father, today we give you thanks for the greatness of your being, for your majesty. And as we think about this name and all that is involved in it, we know that we could go on forever talking about your power and majesty and glory in creation and your wisdom and finite care in even the smallest areas of our lives, the veins in the leaves, the trees that breathe out oxygen and inhale carbon dioxide, and our bodies that inhale oxygen and breathe out carbon dioxide. What can we say except thou art great, O God, we worship and praise you and adore you, and through Jesus Christ, our Lord, are able to call you Father. And I pray that if there are friends watching online who know not Christ, that they will, in fact, accept him as Lord. And this I pray in his name. Amen.
God Almighty, the great 